Uh, if you would, please stand and join us for worship.
was lunch time and my father was praying for the lunch that we were about to eat. But there was only one problem. Our table was empty. My earliest recollections is finding myself at the age of five, walking the street, eating from dumpsters. We were not able to have food at all, at all. We were forced to live with 17 of our other relatives in a very small shanty. No toilet, a lot of crime, no running water. There's a lot of rape for children. If you want to be out of poverty, then you have to deal with drugs. Some of my friends were actually sold into prostitution. And as darkness engulfed them, the devil takes over. One morning, I just woke up that, you know, my uncle is just touching me in some parts of my body that I just thought to myself, wait, this can't be happening. My father was murdered right next to my mother. And I knew that moment that my life had changed. I watched as my 10-month-old sister died in the laps of my mother out of starvation. My relatives always tell me, Michelle, you are so ugly. You look exactly like your father. You will become nothing but a thief and a drug addict when you grow up. And those were the words that I heard from people who I expected to love and take care of me. Poverty had told me I am hopeless, I am nothing, and I believe that. But right in the middle of this desperation, it was then that compassion intervened. One Sunday morning, my Aunt Carol, she registered me in that compassion project. What joy and dancing came to my home at the news that I finally got a sponsor. And it's in my first letter. We were back and forth. They told me you're my first friend outside my country. She said words like, Richard, I love you. And that lightened me up. My sponsor told me that, Michelle, you are beautiful. You are precious to us. We are proud of you. And we are praying for you. And we love you. And the words touched the very depth of my heart and soul. Eighteen years later, here I am, a child rescued from hopelessness. She was 15 years old. Her name is Ashley. Her name was Heather. I called her mom. One act saved my life. Saved my life. When you act, the choice is yours. Sponsor a child through compassion today. Release a child from poverty. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Once again, good evening, everybody. I love the enthusiasm. Um, come on, everybody. It's so quiet tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. No? Yeah. Should we just go home and wrap it up? No. Just close the no. Come on, everybody. Let's go home. Let's be excited to be here. Anyways, so anyways, I uh, love seeing you guys. A uh, little less people here tonight. So I don't know if Keith, you scared everybody away. You finally came to a Saturday night and they stayed home. But anyway, so I need you guys to bring up the energy. Um, anyways, before I get into tonight's message, a couple quick things to consider. Uh, one, I know I've been saying this a lot, but River Valley Conference is coming up. And I looked at the breakout sessions they have, and they are excellent. And a lot of things that we looked at, things that we're going to need to do as we grow and move forward, are in those breakout classes. So please consider coming down to that. Uh, the other thing I want to quick announce is uh, we saw Compassion International, great organization, right? Uh, great video. Now next week, uh, we're having a weekend that's actually, we're just going to look at focusing on kids and children all weekend. And here's what we're going to do. One, Mike's going to take up an offering, a special offering to give to that next weekend. That's exciting, right? So please prepare for that, plan for that. Outside of your tithe, whatever God will lay on your heart to give to them during here next weekend. Uh, we're also going to talk about some children's ministries coming up, and we're looking at help. And like, I think last weekend we had 20 kids in the back. You know, and if that trend continues, we're going to need help. So we're going to actually talk about a few videos and how we can, how you can get involved. And the other thing that we're going to focus on next week, kid-wise, that I'm pretty excited about, uh, what is that, Zach, that we're doing next week? 
uh, Logan's dedication. You guys hear that? Isn't that exciting? So, and I know Hannah can't wait to be out for next weekend, so she's excited. Uh, she's going to do all the talking she said, and she wants all the attention on her. I'm just kidding. But uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to do something a little bit different next week, and, and I honestly am very excited about this. Um, we're going to dedicate him, obviously, and that's awesome. But um, unlike normally, I'm not going to talk as much, praise God, right? And, uh, and I'm going to keep it really short, and then they're going to just talk about their journey. And how God really was with them during a, you know, a time, I'm sure, difficult seasons, struggling in their faith, sadness, confusion, all that. Yet, obviously, we see the beautiful end that God had intended. But we all know Gideon that sometimes can have a rough patch. Well, you know, he's going to talk about that next weekend. So next weekend is all about kids. So I'm getting an amen on that? Amen. amen. We're excited. One more thing, too. Uh, we have flowers in the back there. I was told that you guys can take those home. And by the way, if you love me at all, please take them home. I have bad allergies. Get them out of this building. So I had to take a center go already today. So take a few flowers home with you. Am I missing anything? Let's get this nice message. Did I see a hand over there? No? Okay. No. I thought I saw a hand there. I'm just crazy. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we thank you for your word. I find so much encouragement in it. Lord, I find guidance and wisdom, and at times even correction, but Father, even when your word corrects my soul, I feel this tremendous love from you. So Father, I pray that we'd be open to what your word has to say tonight, that it would permeate just not our minds, but our hearts and our whole being, transform the way that we think and ultimately how we live for you. Lord, we need you. In fact, it says without your spirit, we can't even see or understand your word. The very desire to apply it comes from your spirit. So I pray that your spirit would be here tonight and speak to us through your word. We give you this time and we give you our lives and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, I really hope you guys have been getting some out of our series on Nehemiah. We've been talking about rebuilding. We went through a lot of different things that, quite honestly, I knew it would be a good book on rebuilding, but I had no idea how many other things that we would look at. I hope that's been challenging you. Now last week we got into it. We talked about, um, anybody remember last week? Confession. Confession, yes. We talked about Confession. And basically what was happening is Israel at the beginning now, for generations they weren't in God's word, but they start to read God's word. And as they do that, they quickly realize that they're in disobedience. They realize that they've been in sin for generations, and that causes them to confess. They begin to confess their sin to God, their disobedience, you name it. And so we took that and we applied it to our lives. And what we realized is that confession, by the way, that Christians, confession should be normative for our life. We should be a, a confessional community. Yes, not just when we come to the faith, but throughout our life, that we need to confess. And we looked at a few areas. One, we talked about how confession starts with reflection. If you're not reflecting on who God is, it will never lead to confession. We talked about how confession is free. It really is. I, I don't know why we hold back confessing things, because I have found that when I finally let go of it, there's so much freedom and joy and restoration in my soul. But sometimes we get stupid, don't we? Yes. And we hold on to our sin, and we don't want to confess it, but it's freeing. Confession heals us. Confession has salvaic value. We looked at that. It's connection to salvation. We looked at connection. It's a sign of genuineness. And that confession stops making excuses. That if we're truly being confessing, and the Spirit is leading us, we finally strip away all the excuses and just begin to confess that God... I don't want to make excuses for my poor decisions. I'm not going to blame the world, but Father, I'm just going to come before you with humility. And it's in those moments that God can begin to heal us. I hope that stirred something in you. I think it did. Last night we had a great, last Saturday we had a great church service. A lot of people here. It felt good. The worship was great. Uh, and then afterwards, I had a couple guys come up and confess some things. And you know what? I loved it. You know. And then it's funny because one guy's confessing to me. You know what the enemy is? This is not even in my notes. I just do this every week. I'm so sorry. But. Uh, <laughs> You know, so um, the devil just tells us, like, you know, nobody's going to ever get you. They're going to judge you. Nobody's going to understand what you're going through. You know, just keep that to yourself. So this guy began to confess, and you could see, like, he was being kind of awkward. And he's like, uh, 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 you know, and he just, you know. And I just kind of got a sense of what he was struggling with. And, uh, you know, and I said, are you struggling with this? And he put his head down. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's it. And I said, well, hey, man, we have all struggled with that, brother. And you can just see that the enemy's lies have been broken off him because he realized that we're all human and we're not called to be critical of one another but to walk out our faith. But that happens in confession, right? And the enemy hates it. 
And the enemy hates it. Yes, he does. So here's where we're going to pick up today. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 34. And that's going to be what we're going to look at tonight, starting there. And uh, you have our phone app that's on there, the notes, or whatever you can read along with me or not. But I'll go ahead and read it. We'll break it down. Verse 34, it says, Neither kings, nor princes, nor priests, nor our fathers have kept your law, nor have we heeded your commandments, your testimonies, that you testified against them. We have not served you in your kingdom, or the many good things that you have gave them. You placed us in large, rich land that you set before us, but they did not turn from their wicked ways. Here we are, your servants today, in the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty. And here we are, servants in it. Has yielded a lot of increase to our kings that you have set over us because of our sins. They have dominion over our bodies, our cattle, at their pleasure, they are in great, or we are in great distress. So here's how he starts this. So basically what's happening is they're confessing to God and they admit their transgression. They say, you know what, we have sinned against you. But they also go on to say, but even in spite of all that, no matter how much we have sinned against you, man, we have a lot of blessings. They admit, like, man, we are blessed beyond measure. But they also go on to admit this, that they're still in judgment to some degree. Now, seven years before, they went into judgment King Nebuchadnezzar because of their sin. But here they are, fast forward, yeah, they're back in Jerusalem. The temple's been restored, the wall's been rebuilt. But they admit that they're still to some degree under God's judgment. Full restoration hasn't happened yet. And their judgment that was from God, they, they admit that they're deserving of it. They realize, like, hey, we deserve this. Okay? And they go on to say that the, the judgment from you that they are still under is in the form of subjection to ungodly rulers' oversight. That's basically what they're admitting. We can tell God that we're still kind of dealing with some of this past judgment because of what we did, because you have some rulers over us that, you know, quite honestly, aren't very godly. And they desire full restoration. <coughs> full restoration. So here's what they want to do. They want to make sure that they don't backslide again. They want to make sure that they don't fall out of favor with God and bring judgment back on themselves like they did in the past. So they're going to put in place a check and balance to make sure this doesn't happen again. In verse 38, here's their check and balance. Verse 38 says, Because of all this, we will make a sure covenant and we will write it. Our leaders, the Levites, and the priests, they will seal it. Then in chapter 10, verse 1, it goes on to say this. Now, those who placed their seal on the document were. So basically what happens is we say, okay, let's make a covenant. We're going to take this. We're going to write it down on paper. We're going to seal it, and we're going to sign it. Now they list all the names. I'm not going to get into all the names because it's just not that important to the message. But they list uh, everybody that's on that document. And when I thought about it this week, so a huge document where they put this on there. Okay, they make this basically covenant promise, all these sort of things. They all sign at the bottom. You know what me think of? Anyone? What's that? Declaration of, Independence. Declaration of Independence. That's what I pictured in my mind, right? Can you picture that? What's that movie where they stole the Declaration of Independence? National Treasure. Yes. National Treasure. Think about that, right? I always like my movie references. <laughs> so here they continue. Now the people with the Levites, the priests, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and everybody who had separated themselves from the pagan people, who had separated themselves to God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, they joined with their brethren and they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given to them by Moses, and to observe and to do all the commandments of God, his ordinance and statutes. And then it goes on to say this, that they state that in marriage, we're not going to intermingle anymore with pagan nations, and God, we promise that we will not defile the Sabbath. That's basically what they write there. God, we promise in this covenant before you that we are going to keep your word and we will not transgress it again. We are going to obey you what your word says. You realize that's what got them into trouble. Isn't that just true today too? You know why most people get themselves into trouble, many Christians? Because they are not obeying God's word. And you know, and it happens so many times. I have mentioned it time and time again. So many people have been in my office or have been in their life and something's falling apart, something's not working. And yet the Word of God, if they were in it, would clearly show them what they need to do to get over their maybe bitterness or pride or anger or hurt or addiction or whatever it is. But they just refuse to, one, get into God's Word and they refuse to submit to it. 
And when we begin to offer biblical advice, they will often say, yeah, that sounds really good, but I want something practical. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. We can look at Israel and think, man, how foolish. But are we guilty of the same thing? So they want to make sure this doesn't happen again. So they make a covenant, they write it on a document, they seal it, and they take an oath that we will never break it. And if we do, God, we will enter into a curse. They've asked God to curse them if they break that. Isn't that bold? Have you ever done that with God? I'd advise you not to. <laughs> Don't do that. Unless you're Jesse. Jesse, do whatever you want. It's going to make your life hard. But don't do that, right? Now, their intention was good, but we're going to find later on that their execution was poor because what did Israel end up doing again? Same thing, right? So, what I want to look at today, the first thing I'm going to look at is this What is a covenant? They enter into this covenant, but what is that? Well, here's what the definition of covenant means. It's a form, a formal, solemn, a binding agreement, a written agreement or promise, usually the seal between two or more parties, especially to perform some action. An agreement to take action and to recover damages for breach of that contract. See, they're the same. We're not going to sign this contract. We're going to work right into this thing. What's going to come of us or what we're going to have to do, the penalty that we will pay if we break this. That's what a covenant is. But here's what I was thinking this week. I thought about a covenant. I don't think that we view covenants the way God intends. I think in American culture today, that's lost. Because we live in a culture where commitment often lacks, doesn't it? It does. Commitment lacks, we're fickle. Um, Our commitment will waver from moment to moment based on our feelings that are always ever-changing, right? How many times do people say, man, this is what I'm going to do with my life or this or whatever. I am not going to waver. And then a week later, a month later, it just wavers. A covenant is not meant to be taken lightly at all. And it's never meant to be broken. If you study covenants in the Old Testament, what you'll find is they make a really big deal out of covenants. So when they make a covenant promise, sometimes it would be like a week-long celebration. They would exchange gifts. Sometimes it would be like blood oaths, vows, it would be publicly witnessed by many people. It was a really huge deal to enter into this covenant promise. It meant a lot. And in there, too, they had in the covenant promise an agreement to recover damages if anybody breached that contract. So if you're a Jew and you broke a covenant, you could be ostracized. It could cost you your job and your good standing in the community. That's what could happen. It wasn't just like, oops, you know, slap on the hand or drop the PowerPoint. <laughs> supposed to have a Jared moment here. Where is he tonight? I, I recovered much quicker than him telling that. So, so it wasn't just like, oops, I made a mistake. It was like a major deal to break a covenant. Paul in Corinthians actually talks about this a little bit. He talks about basically separating or ostracizing a person okay, who's in this horrible sin. And he's trying to do it to produce shame in that person so they can bring about a changed behavior. They're ostracized for their good and the good of the community. If you broke a covenant, it was very serious. It could lead to wars, major conflict. Once again, you could be ostracized. It could affect your livelihood and your relationships. It was extremely serious. Because breaking that covenant was deemed detrimental to everyone in that community, and therefore it had a lot of consequence tied to it. They actually said, God, curse us if we break this. But today, we commit, we don't follow through, we make promises, we breach contracts. We take these things lightly, don't we? I think one of the reasons why we do that is American independence and autonomy that we all want. Nobody can tell me how to live my life. I answer me. But American independence and autonomy that we desire so bad to have is bred an unhealthy view of self. It's bred to the point that it's a me-first mentality. What I want, what makes me happy, and that me-first selfish mentality hurts integrity. So we're always going to put me before anything else. You know, if I make an agreement or a covenant with something or somebody, that's great until suddenly it doesn't fit what I want. I think commitment's lost in our society. I think we live in a throwaway culture. We have and flow with our feelings. 
If we get pressured, we quit. Or, or here's the thing, we'll, we'll do it if it's convenient. If it's easy, if it affirms me, if it meets all my perceived wants or needs, if it conveniently fits in my schedule or my priorities, yeah, then I'll do it. But that is not covenantal commitment at all. It's just not. Right? That's not what God intends. You know me, I can't help doing a sermon without quoting a movie, especially Tom Cruise movies. You know, he's got a mad crush on him. So. Um, I've, I've quoted this movie before, if you've been mad, but this is a different one I've never talked about. But here's what I thought about as far as American mentality of commitment versus maybe another culture. So in the movie, there's a scene where these uh, two lawyers are going back and forth, one out to defend these guys, that ultimately cause the death of a soldier because they're told to do a code red, right? Their boss said, you've got to do a code red, a disparate reaction, but in the process, a guy accidentally dies. Yeah. Well, these two lawyers are going back and forth, and one lawyer says, I don't care if they're given a code red. Human decency tells you you just don't do it. It doesn't matter what somebody says, you don't fall through in what you're told to do when it comes to something like that. And they're about to point out a difference between a Navy officer that's serving in Washington, D.C. versus a Marine at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. They're going to show there's a big difference there. So, so the one guy says, man, the, the Navy in Washington says, man, I give orders all the time and nobody listens. <laughs> Parents, you get that? Right? That sounds like just home. <laughs> so he's like, man, I give orders all the time nobody listens, so what's the big deal? But another lawyer comes back and he says this, pointing out, the errant thinking in that lawyer's mindset. He says, yeah, but we live in a place that has softball games and marching bands. They live in a place where if you don't want you to do what you're told to do, you could get shot and die. He says, that has life and death consequences. Ours doesn't. See, we think that follow through is an option, but for an Israelite, this covenant is life or death. They don't have a choice but to do what it says. Or I thought about the difference in the culture between, for example, an American today or a Jew back in Jesus' time. Think about how we view uh, debt reconciliation. Okay? In America, if I charge up too much, make bad financial decisions, screw up over and over, what can I do? Not for bankruptcy. Not for bankruptcy. But if you're a Jew in Jesus' time and you don't pay your debt, your whole family could get thrown into slavery until it's paid back. Because you know what? You follow through on your commitments. Y'all track with me on the difference? Anybody feel this in America a little bit? Yeah. And don't, don't get me wrong. Because of my flesh, sometimes I like that in America because there's times when my flesh doesn't want to fall off your either. Does everybody feel that way? Oh, yeah. There's times where, especially, has anybody ever, and I've mentioned this before, but it's always good to confess, right? How many times, or has anybody here agreed to be part of something at church and then later on thought, why did I say yes to that stupid thing? Y'all raise your hands like we've all done it, right? It happens. And then the, the other thing I thought about, and then we're going to switch gears here, but um, see the movie Last Survivor? The true story about the soldier, and his whole team was killed, and he was wounded terribly, and he, he barely survived, and gets to this village. And this village, basically the Muslims, they vow, they take an oath, a covenant, to protect this soldier with their life. Basically the whole village is saying, we are going to risk everything. We could go to war with other villages for protecting him, but you know, we, we're going to give you our life. That covenant commitment. Covenant commitment puts the commitment above the individual, their needs, wants, and feelings. It's of the utmost priority. It's above all and overall. That's what covenant commitment means. And what Israel is doing is serious. And why is it? Because they realize that transgressing God's word is separation from Him, and they don't want to risk that. My second point tonight, I want to connect that to us. We talked about covenant, what is covenant? But I want to connect it to you and I. We, you may not realize this. But we Christians are in a covenant. Did you know that? If you are a Christian, you are in a covenant. We all are. First Corinthians chapter 11, here's what Jesus said. He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, and my blood do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Hebrews chapter 9 says this, that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, for those are called that they may receive the promise of eternal life. Jesus brought to us the new covenant. If you truly put your faith in the Lord, okay, if you did that, you engaged in and committed to being a part of that 
covenantal promise. You did. By making the decision to put your faith in Jesus, you actually become a part of that covenant promise. You're part of a covenant. You know that? Sounds like you're having fun back there. I love that. <laughs> and the covenant that we have, by the way, is really what I call blood covenant. It's a blood oath. And the blood that binds us in that covenant, okay, is the blood of Jesus. And it is not to be taken lightly. I think he's murdering the kids. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh well. We just up there on insurance day for kids. And we don't need kids. So we're good. So, uh, our liability if somebody gets hurt. So we're good. So, so uh, the blood of Jesus, that covenant that we are saved by, is not to be taken lightly. Especially what he says in Hebrews chapter 10. He said, How much worse punishment do you suppose who we thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. He's saying, don't take that blood covenant of Jesus lightly. This is a big deal. We are in a blood covenant. And I thought, the covenant that we talk about, I think is most clearly on display in Christian community. Did you know that? That we are in a covenant and that means we are actually in a covenantal community. Did you know that? See, church is not just something that you go to, you know, I'll just pop in here or whatever, you know, just to build that tent. No, to be part of a church is to be part of a covenantal community. Did you know that? And this is really important stuff. I was really hoping to be more people here this weekend. Lots of preaching next week. I bet you didn't hear it. <laughs> or the weekend after. Um, we're a covenantal community. And being in a Christian community, to be in fellowship, is not optional. Now, this is not the point of the message, so I'm not going to double down on it. We've gone into great length. But there's a lie out there in Christianity that somehow I can be right and close and grow my faith and not be in church and fellowship. But that is simply not biblical or true. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. I'm not going to go into that because that's not the message. So often churches today, when they do membership classes, you know one of the things that's common out there? We talked about it. We've never done it, but... They have people, when you become a member of the church, actually sign a covenant promise on a piece of paper to become members of that church. Now, obviously, when you sign that, um, it doesn't necessarily legally bind us in our courts, per se, but I think it's a great reminder of the serious commitment that we make, that a person makes to God and to that church. Right. Say, yes, God, this is where I'm laying down roots. God, this is where you have called me to be. This is my community that you called me to I remember years ago, um, everything was so confusing. I uh, grew up in Cloquet, going to church, fine, happy with life. Uh, but we felt like to come here. And, uh, and so uh, we moved. And uh, if you like West Lewis, don't judge me, but I couldn't. I hated the idea of going to Gary. Okay, I love Cloquet. But we wanted to be closer to the church that God had called us. So we moved our whole family here. And we're here for a little bit. I love Nathan. I love Ryan. I uh, love the church. And then within basically 24 hours, both pastors quit. I'm like, well, that stinks. But I'm not new. I'm not. I'm pretty new to the church, and we're not really here a long time, and we we'll just go somewhere else. And God spoke to me, and He said, I, "I brought you there. I knew this was going to happen. I'll tell you when I call you out, right?" Amen. So, um, so, I, so we stayed, and lo and behold, here we are years later, for better or for worse. So it's a serious reminder, and that's also why a lot of churches will actually put the word covenant in their name to remind people that hey, we're in a covenant. So being part of a covenantal community, part of that covenantal promise, there are expectations for us that God had when you agreed to be part of that. And that's what I want to look at today. Things that we need to do, things that we are committing to as a part of this covenantal promise and covenantal community. And it's not to be taken lightly. Here's the first one that we agree to do. Once you decide to follow God and be in that covenantal community, you decide to do life together. Okay? This is not just a thing that people say. It is really God's intention for his family of believers. That we would do life together. You know what, pastors? You can tell when things are really starting to change. When there's an organic connection to your people. When they start just spending time together outside of church, then you can really begin to see, like, okay, this is really what God intends. Doing life together involves making concerted efforts so that others can more naturally, easily be in your life. Not just around you, but really in your life. Doing life together demands commitment. But it involves more than that. 
Doing life together means that we will face daily challenges and joys together. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything that we are doing together. I mean, if a family member is hurting, well, we all hurt. If one's rejoicing, we all rejoice. But we have to be in it for all of it. Acts chapter 2. All who believe were together, they had all things in common, they sold their possessions, they divided amongst everybody who had a need. They continued daily with unity in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate the food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Like, daily they're connecting. They're spending time in each other's homes. They're sharing food and money and resources. They are really doing life together. Being in a community is a, a give and take. It really is. And I hope when people come here, they are blessed by it whether it be financially, relationally, spiritually, whatever, I hope that they love and they take something away from here. But they're also called to bring something here, right? Like it's a give and take. We take from and we bring to. That's what it is. It's an exchange in community. So what would it be like in a family if one of the family members was only a taker? How'd that turn out for a family? You ever seen that in a family where somebody's just a taker? Yeah. Dysfunctional, maybe it's a husband. I use guys, but guys are stupid, so um, at least that's what I've been told. Maybe it's me that I'm stupid. It's mom. Yeah. It's mom. So uh, imagine if it's a husband. He's not really contributing to the family. He's not connected to the wife emotionally. He's not helping out around the house. He's just doing his own thing. What does that do to that family? It strains it. It hurts the family. It makes others have to pick up um, where they aren't willing to pick up and to do and to fill in. And, it's not good. Being part of a covenantal community, doing life together, means that, man, I want to be blessed by you guys, but I want to bless you guys. People have this attitude, like, they, they, they view church like it's going to a, a ball game. Some popcorn, sit down and see, you know, take care of me, entertain me, and feed me, but, you know, it's more than that. Actually, it's about, if you're a part of that, it's not about watching the game, it's about getting in the game. That's right. That's what we're called to do. So, Doing life together, you know what that means? It's going to be messy at times. There's just no way around it. If you think it's not going to be messy, and you are so in for a rude awakening, okay? And I'm going to get into a little bit. Actually, God wants it to be messy. I'll talk about that shortly. But it can be messy, but as a family, we have decided that we are bound to each other and that we are committed to the messy because you don't just break the covenant, right? So it's not like, well, uh, church is fun, I'll go, but you know. As soon as he says something I want to hear, or as soon as you know somebody irritates me, then I'm done. <laughs> That's not covenant community, is it? Not at all. It's the sickness and the health until death do we part. That's really what it means to be connected. Being in covenant community, we are committed to support that community and the people in it. We commit to say, okay, I want to support the people and the community and everything involved with it. I want to support that. So how do we support each other? Well, there's many ways that we do it. You know one of the biggest ways that we support one another? Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. And we also do it emotionally. Anybody need emotional support? I do. We are called to support one another, that's including emotionally. It says in Romans chapter 12, it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. But oftentimes when things get a little icky and it's not fun, it's not, you know, when it's it's messy and there's, there's weeping involved. That's like, like ah, that's not my thing. It's not what I come to church for. Right? But I tell you what, if one of us is hurting, we should all hurt. And one of us rejoices like a beautiful adoption, then you know what? Like I felt like it was a victory for us all. Sorry. I'm not trying to steal from you guys, but you know, I'm happy for you, but I'm happy for us. Because we weep together and we rejoice together. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, there should be no disunity in the body of Christ. I want to say that again, no disunity in church. Okay? But that the members should have the same care for one another. It's not just caring for your friend or your relatives. Every single person in that church you're to care for. And it goes on to say, if one member suffers, that all members suffer. If one's being attacked, we're all being attacked. If one struggles, we all struggle. Because we're in it together. Being emotionally supportive means this, that we have to value, and personally, we are vulnerable, honest, transparent, 
that we are supportive, not critical, not judgmental, and that we saturate everything with grace and love and everything that we do. That's what it means to support each other emotionally, right? That's what that means. We support each other spiritually, like you said, Cindy. We pray for each other and help out. We support one another with resources. Okay? Financially, food, our world goods, whatever things that we have aren't ours, by the way, anyway, they're God that we steward. So it means that we have to support each other in very practical, tangible ways. It says this in 1 John. It says, we know that Jesus laid his life down for us, therefore we have to lay our lives down for one another. It goes on to say, if you have the world's goods and you see a brother in need and you don't give him those practical things, he's saying the love of God does not abide in you. Because I'm saying, my little children, let us love not just in words and what we say, not let it be lip service, but in our actions and in truth. Because love and action, you, see, you, you show it. Talk is cheap. And I know you did, a, you did a message on this. James chapter 2. It says, if a brother or sister is naked and tested through daily food, and when you said, man, I'll pray for you. You're hungry, you're starving? I'll pray for you tonight after my dinner. Like, he said, if that's you, you're missing the point. Because he goes on to say this. What good is it if you say you're going to pray for them and they should be in peace, but you don't have to give them things that are needed for the body? What does it profit? Thus, faith by itself, it does not have works, it's dead. So if our heart, okay, is for God and for his kingdom, then you know what? We're also going to support it financially. Because God said, what your treasure is, so your heart will be also. You want to know what you're passionate about? Look at a lot of things. Time, money, and emotion. Those tell you what's important to you. And so if our heart is for the people here, if our heart is to reach the people that God intends to bring in this community, if that's really our heart, then we're going to support Mission Creek Church, including financially, because we want to make a difference in God's kingdom. Paul's bold, isn't he? And if I were to ever say this, I'd get fired. Second Corinthians, he says this. He's basically saying, man, you guys have an offering to take up an offering and to bring it to Jerusalem because there's a famine going on. Okay, this is what's going on there. But he goes on to say this. He says, I'm testing the sincerity of your love. He's basically saying, I'm going to find out whether or not you truly love. He goes on, by the diligent giving to help others. If you know the grace of our Lord, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that you might become rich. I do not mean that others are ease and that's your burden, but that the equality in the community. Now at this time, your abundance supplies their lack, and that their abundance will supply your lack at some point. That we would have equality. It is written, who had a lot gathered had just enough, and who had not enough had just enough. It's basically saying, because everybody shared, we were all okay. But I love what he said there. He said, I'm, I'm testing to see if your love is genuine, because talk is cheap. Right? So in covenant community, we are committed to help each other spiritually, emotionally, and with the physical resources, if need be. We're committed to grow together. Did you know that? We have committed to one another to say, I'm going to make this my church community, and I'm committed to grow with you. Right? We grow in many ways. One, we grow in our knowledge. One of the ways of being in community is we grow in our knowledge. Here in Nehemiah, what we read a couple weeks ago is that we saw that the reading and understanding of God's word happened together as a community. They weren't like, nah, I got my own thing going over here. They came together to grow in knowledge together. Six hours. Six hours, yeah. And then six more in worshiping. Twelve hours. See, there's many verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, on and on, where God clearly states, I actually heard a guy say this to me, Recently, he's like, I don't really need to be in church because I have the Holy Spirit and he'll teach me all that I need. I don't need anybody else. First of all, when you hear that, what does that sound like? Is that the P word? Are you proud? Bingo. You want a foot massage from your wife? <laughs> no? Not even a little bit? That's a disgusting to doesn't it? I'll do it back somewhere else. Thanks, <laughs> 
But this guy's like, man, I don't need anybody. I got the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, yes, you do have the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can, and you should read your Bible, and you should have a personal relationship. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4 make it very, very clear that God has placed teachers and pastors and others to help us grow in our knowledge. That no one person can fully learn and fully grow outside of covenantal Christian community. It is impossible to do that. You can grow some, I believe, but God has intended for us to grow and to be taught and around other people. We all grow together when we decide to all use God's gifts. Because you know why? No one person has all the gifts. You may have a gift, you may have a gift, you and you, you may have a gift, but you don't have all the gifts. But together, when we come together, then all of God's gifts are here, and those gifts help us to work and to grow, and they edify the body. But if you just say, man, I'm going to do my own thing, you're not getting all these other gifts. And by the way, you're being selfish because that means you're hoarding your gift. Okay. And he's going, to let, he's going to reinforce this later on by actually going on to say this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says there's a diversity of gifts, right? A diversity of ministries and a diversity of activities, but it's the same God who works in all of them. But the manifestation of God's gifts is given for everyone, for the profit of all. For the profit of everybody. And later on, he enforces it by saying, you know what, the foot needs the eye, the eye needs the hand, the hand needs the head. They all need each other. So every Christian needs other believers, and we need covenantal community. We are committed to growing sanctification. First Thessalonians says, this is the will of God for you. Ever you ever want to pray like, God, what you will for my life? I just want to know what to do. You know, Noah, we talked about that a little bit, like you're praying about what God wants for your life, right? I love that. Love Noah, by the way. Um, but one of the answers to that, if you want to know God's will, it says right there, God's will is your sanctification. So that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. It says that God's will is your sanctification, that we should abstain from immorality, that we should not have control our flesh and sanctification and honor, not in passion or simple lust, like unbelievers who do not know God. So God said, I want you to grow in sanctification, but do you know that that process happens in Christian community and not apart from it? We grow in sanctification and part of a church body. It happens a few ways. One, it happens with accountability. You know, one of the ways that I have seen, I've worked with a lot of addiction, as you know, normally the guys here from TC, but they couldn't make it tonight. Um, one of the first indicators I could tell when a guy started to use again is his fellowship with Wayne. The moment he would start to pull back from fellowship, usually it was like a red flag. Because they didn't want people to know. But one, we all need accountability. And you know what? We should want accountability. Because any one of us can wander, drift, we can compromise, fall into sin. And sometimes it happens in a way that we don't even actually know what's happening. But those in our life that love us often can catch it, and out of love gently guides back on the track. We need to sometimes lovingly point it out to others and have it point out to us. People that can encourage us and challenge us. When I say accountability, I'm not talking about a Pharisee that's going to be mean. I'm talking about a loving person who cares for you. And you care for them. We have to hold each other accountable to adhere to God's word. To, to stay on what it says. Because we live in a culture that's compromising that. Sanctification happens in the community when we are guided with truth. Isaiah 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know why people aren't being sanctified and set free? No, God's truth in their life. I said it earlier. And sanctification happens in relationships, and it's usually not the easy relationships. Let me tell you right now. God wants to sanctify you, body, soul, and spirit. And most of that sanctification is not going to happen with the easy relationships. It's most likely going to happen in the tough relationships. Okay? It's those ones that test you. I want to say this. Did you know that God actually from time to time watched you to get irritated in church community by other people? Sometimes he actually wants you to get irritated and have your buttons pushed in church. But what do we usually do when somebody runs us the wrong way? Zach pushes Colton's way. He's already pushing a button. Yeah. Right? We run away. We run away because it's irritating, frustrating, and I want to deal with it. But it's often that very thing that God is using to bring something out in us so he can change it. It's often those sort of things that God is trying to use. Okay? Because he's trying to teach us maybe to be more 
forgiving or patient. Or maybe he's trying to get you to confront a behavior because maybe what you struggle with and need to be sanctified is you walk in fear and uh, um, you have to sacrifice self. But whatever it is, it's the things in community that Abba God uses. It talks about iron sharpening iron. That process, by the way, is not easy. That is a hot, messy noise. There are sparks that fly. It's a violent process, but it comes with beautiful results. Often the process of sanctification is messy for us in community, but if, if you stay the course, it will be beautiful in your soul. Chapman said this one time, listen to this. Take this to heart, please. Church fellowship is a great factory or incubator for developing agape love. When we have to deal with the stress and strains of dealing with other people that test and mature that love, it really means we mature and grow together. But that usually happens once again, it's easy to love my wife, she's my best friend, but sometimes it's the people that irritate me that God's actually using to grow me. Right? That Christian run from fellowship, I don't want to be around that. So we make a commitment to being uncomfortable at times. When you decide to be in a church, you're going to be uncomfortable. And no matter where you go, you might go to another church, you might have a a honeymoon season, but every church is going to have that. Because what's happening is you're actually running from what God's doing, and he'll chase you down. But you're taking a person here, go to another church, you know what you'll find there? Another Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> can't help myself tonight. I love you. Another irritated person, I love you. And I think a lot of Christians won't grow because they refuse to put down roots. They just don't. And here's the thing, you know where the, gra- you know where the grass is the greenest? <coughs> No, it's not. Yeah. Where you water it, right? Grass is the greenest where you water it. Put down roots here, begin to grow here, begin to water the turf here, and begin to see fruit from it. I know Jesse knew he just likes when that was me. <laughs> Too many people water in community. We commit to submitting to godly leadership. We do. To be part of a church community, we are submitting to godly leadership albeit imperfect leaders. There is no perfect church or perfect leaders. So if you're waiting for that, then you're always going to be running. Okay? God has placed people over me that at times have thrown me nuts, that I've, I've, honestly, I've judged them. I thought they're not very godly. They're not very knowledgeable of Scripture. I can't believe it. And yet God has said, Rob, I have placed them under you. What are you going to do with that? And the other right answer is, submit. So we are committed to submitting to godly leadership. God has ordained structure that des- uh, designated or designed it in such a way that we are all to be under biblical authority and eldership. But pride makes that hard for us, doesn't it? Pride does. But there is no gold alone Christian out there that's going to grow well, that's not in God's plan. It says, Obey those who rule over you, be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those that need to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not greed, for that would be unprofitable for you. And Ephesians 4 says the same thing. God has placed and ordained people to lead. He just has. People think that they can grow and serve God well and be a healthy Christian, but if they're not in fellowship, they're outside of God's will. Submission to leadership actually shows humility. And God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When you have a humble heart, when you submit, God's going to bless that. We are committed here to God's truth. In covenant community, we agree to hear to God's word, to solid Christian orthodox and biblical teaching. We commit to not waver on the black and white issues of God's word that we will never compromise, ever. But we flex and show love in the gray areas of doctrine. That's what we are committed to doctrinally here. I will never compromise that Christ is the only way to salvation. But I am not going to get contentious over rapture theology. Right? Okay? Just not going to do that. Come on. I know. <laughs> I love what John said here. Of all the things that he could say about these people, right? Like, there's so much that he could say. You know what he said, though? He's like, man, I love you get together. I love your gathering. I love your worship. He didn't say that. Of all the things he could pat them on the back and praise them for, he says, man, this is what makes me so happy. When people testify to me that you walk in truth. 
I have no greater joy to hear that my people are walking in truth. That's what we always have to do here. In 1 Timothy, it says this. He says, remain in Ephesus and tell them not to teach any other doctrine. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says if anybody teaches anything other than what Christ taught, okay, and what accords with godliness, it said you need to remove that person from your life. So we are called here to make a commitment to adhere to, to not compromise, and we are committed to obey God's word. And that's the crux of it, isn't it? It's not just what you know, it's what you do. So we are committed to obedience to God's word. At the very end here, we are committed to unity. Okay? We are you're going to hear me beat this as a dead horse. <clears throat> and we are committed to unity. God's doing great things, good things are happening here, and we are not going to let the enemy come in and mess that up. Okay? And a divisive person shows immaturity. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. It says unity is a sign of maturity. And actually goes on in the text to say that that unity will happen when we allow leaders to mature and equip us. And that's going to edify the church, and it should lead to unity of the faith. We have to contend for unity here. And here's the final thing that we are committed to. Man, and I, and I will die on this one. I will fight for this one. I will contend for it. But we are committed to love one another. We have to make a commitment right now to say, God, I want to love really well. And when we love well, then we just say, God, I can love better. Right? Like, I don't think any of us can say, no, I love perfectly well here. Like, God, I want to love better. I want to love more. I want this church to be known by our love. It's why we have to deal with some issues, because we want to make sure that our culture here is not toxic. So that no matter who you are coming off the street, that you come in here and say, man, I felt love. We don't want people to come here and get caught up in, in Christian things that people fight about, get foolish about, and divide each other over, right? I want to come in and say, man, I felt love. And it was great to see how close they were as a church body. John 13 says, I, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I love you, love one another. And by this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not if you say that you're a Christian or have a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or go to a Christian concert. He said, they will know that you are the real deal when you love other believers. In John 15, it says, this is a commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And there is no greater love than to lay down your life for his friend. How did Jesus love us? He died for us. He sacrificed it all. That means we're called to lay our lives down for one another in this church community. Can I get an amen? amen. And I don't care if the world, can I, the world's going to get worse. You know that, right? Like if you read God's word, it's not pretty. But I believe that church community can be a beautiful oasis, an escape, a place where we can come and say, no matter what's going on in my life, at my work, in the world, no matter what's happening here, man, it is a safe place, and I always feel loved, right? Yes. So how do we make that happen? It doesn't happen with me. And when every single one of us says, no, that's not the pastor's values, that's not the other boys' values, those are my values, and I will fight for love, I will fight for unity. Amen? Amen. And that's when things begin to change. And by the way, a lot of you love well. You do. I feel loved by a lot of you. Even Jesse. I tease him, but I love him. <laughs> I know he loves me a lot. But, but here's where we go. And this is where I'm going to end it today. We know that. Anybody, raise your hand if the first ever message in Christianity you heard about love. Not one hand raised. But Josh raised his hand. This is the first time you heard about love. Cindy, you have failed as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> we have all heard about love, right? Like, it's not the first time. You've probably heard it many times. So we know that we should love, blah, blah, blah. And yet, how many times do Christians do hurtful things to one another? Act unloving to one another? Say hurtful things? Now let's not fool ourselves. The world is watching how we interact with one another. Okay? And God knows. It's just not enough to say that we love. We have to truly and authentically love. We're called to be in covenant community to God and to Christian community, to its people, and to its purposes. And breaking that community, that fellowship, is in many ways breaking that covenant commitment. And it says this in 1 John chapter 2, he says, hey, they went out from us, okay, to show that they're not really of us. Because had they been of us, they would have stayed. It's like when they went out, they showed who they really were. Because a true Christian is in a covenant with God and is part of that covenant community of believers. 
as we continue to rebuild over last year, and God's going to send us new people. I know that he is, he has, and he will. I want to make sure that this community and people that are new in their faith okay, understand what a deep and special honor it is to be part of a covenantal community in God's family. In fact, we're going to do membership classes this fall, and I want to just, I think I'm going to integrate study and covenant with them. So, man, we're excited for you here, but man, just know what you're coming to be a part of. This is huge, and it's exciting, but it's a big responsibility. Anybody track with this tonight? Yeah. Anybody getting this? Yeah. Anybody feeling this in their soul? Yes, yeah. I'm going to keep saying it all night until I get, you guys get excited. Everybody get excited? <laughs> yeah. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Father, we are a community. We're in covenant because of what Christ did. Not anything that we've ever done, Father. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, I pray that we would never take that covenant lightly. Not only what Christ did, but we would never take this community lightly. And Father, we are called to, to be committed to truth and to love one another and to, to support one another. Lord, I pray that you do something great in our hearts and our minds. Father, no matter how bad the world would get, I pray that we would look different, we would act different. And Father, we would shine brightly. We need your spirit to do that. We thank you for your love and grace. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, please stand as we do one more song and then I'll close in prayer.
you